Thank you for joining us. We will now begin the event. Hello, thank you for joining us for the faculty, fall faculty COVID-19 town hall. My name is Tracy George and I am Vice Provost for Faculty Affairs and a professor of law and political science. Today, I will be moderating this town hall, including the question and answer portion at the end of the event. If you have questions during the event, I encourage you to submit those through the live Q&A feature available through Zoom. I'd like to start by introducing those joining us for the town hall today. First, Daniel Deermeyer, Chancellor and University Distinguished Professor of Political Science and Management. Sibel Raver, Vice Provost and, and Provost and Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and also Cornelius Vanderbilt Chair of Psychology and Human Development. Dr. Jeffrey Balzer, President and CEO of the Vanderbilt University Medical Center and Dean of the School of Medicine. Dr. William Schaffner, Professor of Preventive Medicine in the Department of Health Policy and Professor of Infectious Diseases. And Pam Jones, Associate Professor of Nursing, Senior Associate Dean for Clinical and Community Partnerships and Co-Leader of Vanderbilt University's Public Health Central Command, uh, Cent Command Center. Um, I'd now like to welcome Chancellor Deermeyer. Well, thank you, Tracy, for the nice introduction. Good afternoon uh, to all of you, and thank you for taking the time to join us at today's town hall. I first want to start with sharing my deep gratitude for all your commitment to our academic mission and also our, the responsibilities that we have to our community here in Nashville uh, that resulted in an exceptional success last year as we wanted to battle one of the biggest challenges the university has ever faced. Uh, but as you all know, the challenges posed by the historic pandemic are far from over. Um, recent developments, of course, including the spread of the Delta variant, uh, breakthrough infections, et cetera, um, forced us uh, to continue to be vigilant and adaptable in order to keep the Sanfis as safe as possible and to continue our mission of discovery and education. Uh, we are here today to share and discuss the current status of our efforts to slow the spread of COVID-19, especially the Delta variant, and to answer your questions. Um, as you will hear today, we are continuing to monitor the situation closely. And just as we did last year, uh, we were doing this in close collaboration with our colleagues um, at the Vanderbilt University Medical Center, who have been just a tremendous partner for us uh, over the last uh, now 18, 19 months. And I just wanna express my gratitude, especially to Dr. Balzer and the tremendous leadership that he has done um, at the medical center and what a, what a terrific partnership it has been. Um, so today we'll talk about, we give you an update on where we stand today, a little bit of an update on where this disease stands, what we're doing in order to deal with it. And, um, and many of these discussions will be informed by, by the point of view of really having some of the top global experts in the field. So we are very, we are very fortunate to work with them and, and, uh, and you know, are really grateful for joining us today and sharing their insights. Um, important point that I wanna make before we go on. The principles that have carried us successfully through last year have not changed. Uh, first and foremost, every decision that we'll make is driven by our mission. And our mission is to be a great research university and, we, and, and to offer a transformative education to our students. We are a residential, uh, we're, we're a residential um, university. And uh, many of the things that we did last year was to try to do everything that we could um, in order to continue with, uh, with our mission as we move forward. Um, we were continually guided by the best science and data that we have available. Um, we would be flexible, um, but we would not overreact either. So we would not try to jump to conclusions and make critical decisions um, just based until we were ready to do so. So uh, that meant is sometimes it takes a while until we're ready to pull the trigger. Um, and some of our peers uh, made some decisions earlier, but we liked the pace in which we were operating because it just gave us more information. And we walked, we walked sometimes, we took a little time to make a decision, but we worked steadily. And I think that that was one of the key um, of the key benefits uh, or the key success factors that we were dealing with last year. And then the last thing, it's just important for, every, for all of us, 
is uh, there's tremendous uncertainty here. There are residual risks. Uh, this is not a risk-free environment and we can't make it so. And so as a consequence of that, we need to maintain adaptable. We need to be able to react and change um, as the situation on the ground and our understanding of the pandemic changes. What, we, what was very successful last year, and I think a very important lesson for us, is that um, you know, we did it together. We did it as one university, we did it as one community. We had good discussions and debates on how do we, how do we wanna move forward, um, but we always did it in a collaborative fashion that's so characteristic on everything that Vanderbilt does. So these principles will guide us as we move forward, um, as we continue to deal with the challenges that uh, COVID-19 presents for us. And um, again, thank you for joining us today and I look forward to the discussion. Great, I think, thank you so much, Chancellor Diermeyer. My name is Sibel Raver. I serve as your provost and as your chief academic officer. And I first wanna just thank all of those who pulled together this event, uh, this important forum for faculty discussion uh, and questions and answers. In particular, I'd really like to thank uh, Vice Chancellor Kopstein and his team, as well as the Faculty Senate Executive Committee, including Mark Magnuson, Ryan Midded, Catherine McTammany, Ben Harris, Rebecca Swan, and Elizabeth Catania. I think faculty leadership is so important uh, in these times, particularly as we are all trying to uh, work together in exactly the way that Chancellor Diermeyer uh, just discussed. I really want to thank uh, our deans who are showing tremendous commitment regarding the topics we're discussing today. And then of course, most importantly to you, our esteemed faculty, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your questions and your perspectives. In my view, we made a deliberate decision to return to campus in person this semester specifically to achieve our goals and our mission. And obviously you worked very hard in the last semester as well to move in this direction. And that specifically is to pursue world-class research, scholarship and education. Last year, we were required to deviate from that on-campus in-person experience during the worst months of COVID. And it's really important to highlight that it is that in-person on-campus experience for which Vanderbilt is known. Thanks to the vaccine, we are no longer in that place and are returning back to campus in ways that we all are very aware of and are excited to move toward. Um, and obviously the Delta variant complicates that, but does not actually change in, in the main um, our overarching objective. Most importantly, thank you to our faculty for making a return to in-person teaching and learning as well as in-person research possible. Last week at the, at the fall faculty assembly, I underscored that you are central to meeting our Vanderbilt mission and what I thought of or described as our triple bottom line, where we carry out the highest caliber of scholarship and research, where we train and inspire the next generation of leaders through our teaching and through all kinds of uh, in-person experiences in dorms, in uh, internship settings, et cetera, and where we offer groundbreaking solutions to some of the world's greatest challenges. At the same time, I recognize that we do our best work, whether it's research or teaching, when we feel not only a sense of shared mission, but also a sense of belonging and trust. And I think that this kind of meeting is exactly the kind of forum that helps to build that, where we're available to answer questions and to address pressing concerns. To support our best work, I can assure you that Chancellor Diermeyer, Vice Chancellor Kopstein and other university leaders um, among countless members of the Vanderbilt community are doing all that we can to support our health and safety as a driving priority. And we meet very frequently, as I'm sure you are all aware, to be able to iron out exactly the path forward that makes the most sense in terms of managing those challenges and those uh, uh, mission-driven priorities. I think it goes without saying that we're in a really challenging time for many of us uh, where uh, across different universities, when I speak with other faculty and other provosts, clearly we are all working for finding innovative ways to support each other's physical and psychological health. On the psychological side, I would mention that there are some faculty who are really uh, very much needing to get out of the home and back into the classroom. Uh, there are other faculty who are managing some challenges in terms of their concern uh, that are uh, one of the issues that I think have uh, been raised today. On the psychological resources front, just managing uh, psychological stressors 
um, it's important to address. And we have uh, just a, for me to mention in this minute, a set of well-being resources, including free teleconsulting counseling um, available through the Work-Life Connections EAP Connect Care link. I'm sorry that that's such a mouthful, but it is. Um, so along with Chancellor Diermeyer and other university leaders and members of my team, I just want to emphasize and reiterate that we are fully committed to supporting the systems and pathways through which your work can thrive. And that includes closely monitoring public health data and guidance, both on campus and in the Nashville community. And then finally, providing timely and transparent updates as information evolves. As such, we've just discussed a little bit about this open and honest dialogue and the ways in which that uh, we hope supports an atmosphere of trust. I'm grateful to each of you for taking part in today's conversation as part of that process. Um, in that spirit, I just wanna take a minute to, over, uh, uh, to underscore and uh, cover the status of vaccination in our community in terms of how many of us are fully vaccinated. Just over 95% of the university community is fully vaccinated, which is an incredibly high number that makes our campus actually, in many ways, the safest place to be in Middle Tennessee. Um, among faculty members, 95% are fully vaccinated, and the remaining 5% in the Vanderbilt community have recently been uh, given approved accommodation or in the process of receiving that form of either accommodation or vaccination. So as you'll hear today, these vaccinations provide robust protection against severe disease despite the Delta variant, and they continue to be the best way to protect our community. In my view, um, this is something that this university should be exceptionally proud of and is truly impressive. Um, again, in, in addition, I think there are other safety measures that we will all need to uphold and which are guided by our close collaboration with our VUMC colleagues and our public health officials. For one, we all have a responsibility to remind one another about wearing a mask, something that's very simple and common sense, uh, and I think is really important, as is physical distancing. And we'll be hearing more about those protocols shortly, both inside and outside of the classroom. I wanna underscore that all these decisions are being made on the basis of data. As an empirical quantitative social scientist, this matters a lot to me, but I think this matters to me as a community member as well. We are a science-driven uh, community and it is really important that we are driven by data and by advice from an incredible array of experts, both close by and uh, in further locations, in distant locations. These include our colleagues at Vanderbilt University Medical Center and the Vanderbilt School of Nursing, several of whom you'll hear from today, um, who are among the world's most trusted and informed experts on these top topics. Uh, we'll also draw upon, we also do draw upon the expertise of the Center uh, for Disease Control and Prevention uh, from the American College Health Association and from local, regional, and national public health officials. Um, so I just want to thank publicly those uh, members of our community who are those public health and medical experts uh, for sharing their knowledge, advice, and so much of their time. Uh, before we hear from them, again, I just want to reiterate thanks and uh, uh, true uh, inspiration from your fortitude and adaptability at, in these times of transition, um, the way in which we are really called upon to pivot uh, and to be uh, very focused on mission, even in the midst of uh, so much news uh, and so much challenge. I really want to thank you for your engagement and your commitment and your continued optimism and your goodwill as we meet our mission, even in the face of this level of uncertainty. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Raver. Dr. Balzer is our next speaker. Dr. Balzer, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Vanderbilt Medical Center is now managing um, over 200 patients in our hospitals, more than our peak last winter. Nearly two thirds are in our adult and children's hospitals here on the main campus. Um, and uh, the remainder are out in the three other regional hospitals that we have acquired in the last two years. Um, the latest report from our medical school's health policy department, um, which goes out to state and local officials all over the region, uh, shows that the rate of increased hospitalizations is now higher than at any point in the nearly two year pandemic. Um, the report also shows that the, the highest rates of COVID-19 are concentrated 
in younger age groups than in prior surges, um, those below age 60. That's because older Tennesseans are vaccinated at high rates. Unfortunately, the same is not true for the younger age groups, particularly in the counties that surround Nashville. The fact is, almost all of the COVID patients requiring care at our inpatient facilities are unvaccinated. These circumstances are consuming our ICU capacity. And while we are still taking hundreds of patient transfers from community hospitals across the region every week, we are now forced to decline far more than we normally would. Um, these are often patients with complex diseases that need our, expert, our special expertise and are not COVID patients. In terms of a forecast, the models we've used reliably here at the medical center actually come from our own medical school's Department of Biostatistics. Those models uh, show that the so-called R0, the rate of infection in the community is finally slowing. Well, that's good news, given the lag between patients becoming exposed and needing hospitalization, our hospitalizations are still forecast to continue rising until later in September. So we're very likely going to have several more weeks of uh, difficult ICU capacity challenges. I want to offer my congratulations to the university on having an extraordinarily high rate of vaccination. Nothing could be more important. The Pfizer vaccine is now fully approved by the FDA and across all age groups, we still see much milder illness in those who are vaccinated. The only exception is patients who are immunocompromised and really can't mount an appropriate response to the vaccine. Those patients such as folks being treated for cancer with chemotherapy or patients on immune suppressants following uh, an organ transplantation. You know, v VMC is actually the largest heart transplant center in the world. So this is one of the larger groups we care for and that's causing us great concern. Um, while these immunosuppressed patients are now receiving third shots per the recent FDA guidance, there is really now even more hope for those patients. The results of a long awaited study of more than 5,000 patients, mostly immunocompromised patients was recently profiled in the Wall Street Journal and other national media. And it showed that monoclonal antibodies developed here by our vaccine center led by Dr. Jim Crow and licensed to AstraZeneca are highly effective at preventing infection in these immunocompromised patients. So we hope this treatment will be approved soon under an EUA and emergency use authorization, both in the US and around the world. The CDC is now reporting trends showing the vaccine's effectiveness decreases over time, <clears throat> excuse me, over time. It's important to say that this was not unexpected. More vaccinated patients are experiencing mild disease than earlier this year particularly those immunized first during the vaccine rollout last winter. On the other hand, it is still the case that in vaccinated patients, we are seeing far less hospitalization and we almost never see the need for ventilator support or of course death. The vaccine is still doing its most important job, what it was actually designed to do, and that's to keep us from becoming severely ill. Nonetheless, as you'll hear on the news, government agencies are making plans to provide booster shots later in the fall. A nationwide booster program of this kind is still really being debated and is going to uh, require additional approvals by both the CDC and the FDA. We're following those developments very closely. Um, if a rollout does occur, we think those uh, who were vaccinated first, the elderly patients and healthcare providers would very likely be prioritized um, in any kind of booster program. I wanna finish by saying um, the pandemic has been hard on people and that includes our people at the medical center. We announced at the beginning of August that everyone at the medical center will be fully vaccinated by no later than September 30th, that's soon. Um, or have an approved exemption. By requiring the vaccine, our goal is to create the safest 
possible environment, not only for our patients, but for everyone working and learning at the medical center. But beyond safety, we are hearing and seeing things in the media and even in our clinics that those of us on the front lines of healthcare uh, find intolerable. Um, yet throughout the pandemic, as we've cared for so many, we've played another important role. In times of turmoil, the voices of great institutions like Vanderbilt grow even stronger and become a source of hope for the millions of people who really are anxious to hear the truth. What I hear every day is that Vanderbilt is a source of reassurance. We're trusted to provide critical, credible information for people across the region and often the entire nation. So in this way, I believe all of, all of us here at Vanderbilt are leaders and leadership can be challenging and even at times risky as we sometimes must endure negative comments, even from friends and family. But as we provide clear, sensitive, informed and above all compassionate guidance, we are caring for people while giving confidence and reassurance to millions our guidance will always be based on evidence. And as evidence evolves, and it will, our guidance will as well. I just wanna thank everyone for your continued support as our people at the Medical Center confront these significant challenges over the coming weeks. Hello everyone. Uh, this is Bill Schaffner and uh, I'm just very pleased to be with you. Jeff has done a wonderful job in looking over the landscape. I'll add just a few words and then I'm ready to uh, respond to your questions. Um, things were going so well early in the summer, right? Cases were down, hospitalizations were down, deaths were down. That was because the dominant strain out there of COVID was the so-called alpha strain. But then along came Delta and Delta changed the whole game plan because it was so much more contagious. Its mutations were such that it made it much easier for the virus to enter the cells back in our throat and behind our noses. It made it much easier for this virus to go from cell to cell, multiplying in large amounts. So that meant the infected person could shed, could exhale much more virus, thus making it very, very contagious. Obviously, it spread widely, and within a matter of just a few weeks, it became the dominant strain that's causing disease in the United States. In effect, it just outran all the other strains. It has been characterized at the moment as being an outbreak among the unvaccinated, and that is certainly the case. Most of the transmission is occurring among unvaccinated people. There is some spillover and mild infections that are called breakthrough cases in people who are vaccinated. But in comparison, the amount of transmission and the hazard that is out there to our communities is so much greater among unvaccinated people. Uh, just to add a few things to what Jeff has said, yes, most of the people in our hospitals today, the vast majority are indeed unvaccinated and this honing in on unvaccinated persons is extending increasingly to children. So the children's hospitals across the state are seeing more admissions due to COVID. We've all heard that this virus is less apt to make children sick. That continues to be true, but that doesn't mean it, the risk is zero, quite to the contrary. So we need to take care of our children. And speaking of children, we all recognize now that all children aged 12 and over are eligible for vaccination. Once again, to reiterate what's been said, our current vaccines continue to provide excellent, excellent protection against severe disease. And that's uh, uh, very reassuring and something that we should take great comfort in and let everyone know 
our still unvaccinated uh, friends and neighbors to try to encourage them to get vaccinated, which is still a major goal, obviously, of public health across the country, in our own state, and in our own community. I'll pass it on now to Pam, and I'm happy to address your questions. So thank you very much, Dr. Schaffner. Um, a quick reminder that if you have questions during the event, please submit those to the live Q&A feature available through Zoom. Um, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Jones to talk to us about our testing and contact tracing efforts for the fall semester. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Schaffner and Dr. Balzer for all your wonderful explanation. I'm gonna hit the high points here for a couple of things that have been pertinent as we have been thinking through what our protocols, the chancellor covered these guiding principles and so I'm not gonna go through them again, but I would just wanna re-emphasize that part of the real power that we've had over the past years working together as a team and, and being incredibly nimble and incredibly flexible, watching the data as it develops and making decisions quickly. And we're seeing that evidenced again this year. And I'll talk through some of those. Next slide, please. This is just the timeline for vaccinations, which you are all familiar with. Um, next slide, please. And here's the totals by population. And there's a couple of things that I really just wanna point out here because there's a perception that many people have that there are large numbers of individuals who are unvaccinated due to an accommodation in our community. And that's really just not the case. If you look at undergraduates, for example, there's only 1.85% of those individuals who have accommodations. Um, graduate students is a little bit higher. Staff was our highest group and we expected that. And actually I'm quite pleased that our staff number is this low. It's certainly better than the vast majority of other places as, as has already been pointed out. And then faculty also are extremely high. So um, as, as uh, Dr. Balzer said, this is something to be really proud of, and, and I'm proud of Vanderbilt for taking the stance that our leadership did uh, last year to, to get us where we are more protected. Next slide, please. These are the current case counts, um, and as, as you know, uh, my, my wonderful colleague Andrea George is the incident co-commander with me, and we watch this every day, all day. Um, and watch for trends. We're quite skilled at this point in time, and the contact tracing team is quite skilled at identifying clusters as they're developing and, and interrogating the data to understand what's really going on. You will see that we had an increase last week. We were fully expecting this as people came back to campus and as the numbers were increasing across uh, our, our communities and frankly, every community. Uh, an important thing to note is that 8% of our cases are those individuals who are, un, I mean, eight cases here are those individuals who are unvaccinated and 55 are in vaccinated population. But remember that when you've got a, a denominator that is basically all vaccinated, almost all the cases you're gonna see are individuals who are vaccinated. So we, we have a very interesting data set here to understand what is the transmission rate, what's the R not, if you will, in an almost primarily vaccinated population. Next slide, please. We did um, start very quickly this week looking at some revised protocols based on these increases in the case counts and uh, increased the masking requirement. It, I, I describe it as uh, I think of it as three layers of protection. One layer is vaccination, one layer is masking, and one layer is physical distancing. You have to have two out of the three, uh, frankly. And if you can physically distance inside and you're vaccinated and do that in a reasonable way, other than when you're exercising and some other things that are noted here, you've got two out of three layers. If you are particularly concerned yourself about your own safety because of a comorbidity or a, a vulnerable individual in your household, put on all three layers, physically distanced, mask, and you're, you're vaccinated. So that's one way to start thinking of it. So we did increase that. We, we are moving to de-densify the dining area some. We knew from last year that if we were to say shut down dining, there's actually quite unintended consequences with that because we contact traced a lot of students who went out to restaurants and ate 
And that was one of the riskiest activities we saw last year. And so there's a it's a it's a balancing act to try to determine, okay, how do we de-densify those dining areas to, and improve that safety, encourage people to eat outside, but we don't want to close down dining because we know we will have unintended consequences associated with that. All visitors are required to wear masks at all times. All individuals who are unvaccinated are required to wear masks at all times. Um, and, and we really want to encourage people to be comfortable wearing masks. They should not feel badly about wanting to do that even when they don't need to. We're really encouraging people to limit off-campus activities because we know, again, as, as the chancellor and others have said and, and the, our provost, we are one of the safest places to be because of our vaccination rate. And then compliance still is a key component of our protocols. And we work very closely with GL Black and others and with Tracy as we see compliance issues to build that accountability back into our culture. And we've been, our, in general, our population has been incredibly cooperative and has done the right thing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we have done masking at large outdoor events where, where um, we really felt like it was an important component and we haven't moved to a rule that you have to mask outdoors. CDC doesn't recommend that for vaccinated individuals even now. But we've done that to be cautious in places. Uh, signage is increased. And again, I encourage each and every one of you to be part of this. You have autonomy in your classrooms and your labs. Do what you need to do. Um, and, and we will do the same with the contact tracing arm. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to address testing a little bit because this has been hotly debated and is rapidly evolving. We were very comfortable this summer not recommending an asymptomatic testing program beyond getting our international students who run vaccinated back and tested um, because we had data that, that we knew we were not getting positives out of our asymptomatic tests that we ran all summer. Now, obviously that's changed. Um, so as the case counts in uh, our town, started to increase and we knew it was more likely that our unvaccinated individuals would test positive, we quickly implemented a plan where they will be tested weekly and we have a compliance that ensures that. And we're starting to see some of those. You saw some of those numbers from last week. Um, we are testing vaccinated asymptomatic close contacts per the CDC recommendation at three to five days post exposure. And the reason this is so important, and we've built a database where we will be able to automate reporting and we'll actually be able to determine what's the conversion rate, what's the R naught, if you will, in a vaccinated population. That We don't have enough data yet to reach conclusions, but we're, we will soon. A uh, small number, you know, again, the individuals who are unvaccinated will be tested. And then we're going to put in place a random testing program I can't tell you today exactly what that's going to look like because we're going to work with our experts in consultation to figure out exactly how many and how we're going to do it, but that will be implemented next week and more to come on that. Um, and lastly, symptomatic testing is available. Thank you so much to the Medical Center for opening the 100 Oaks location that now has testing seven days a week. And we know people are going and getting tested when they're symptomatic, which is a, a really good thing. It's all about symptoms this year. If you're symptomatic, don't come to work, don't go to class, and go get tested. Next slide, please. Um, I, I, I'm not going to talk through this because this, these are all things that, that Dr. Balzer and Schaffner um, addressed quite well. We know Delta has changed things. Next slide. The trends, um, as I said, we are seeing increased cases. So far, it's manageable, and we watch it every day. We are seeing some asymptomatic close contacts who are testing, which is giving us an indication of how often close contacts actually convert. The bulk of them still that are converting are household contacts or more travel, those kind of things, not just routine uh, activities on campus so far, we haven't seen. We did have a hot spot and we tested it quickly, got them into isolation and it burned out in about two days, which was quite remarkable. Next slide, please. And we're in good hands. Um, you know, there's lots of nurses, there's lots of people in the command center. All of those structures that we had in place last year are there. And we've got great alignment across senior leaders where we can rapidly make decisions. 
also we're, we're working on contingencies for housing in case we need more uh, isolation and quarantine. I think I'll stop there. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to address the group today. Thank you very much, Dr. Jones. I appreciate it. We are now gonna move to the question and answer session uh, section of the program, beginning with some questions that were previously submitted. Um, our first question is, why is Vanderbilt not conducting surveillance testing of asymptomatic vaccinated community members? I'm gonna ask Dr. Balzer if you could start us off in the discussion of that question, please. Yeah, I'd be happy to, uh, Tracy. Um, asymptomatic testing, even before the vaccine became available, was a very debated topic because <clears throat> it's, it's really an insensitive way. In other words, it's really a lot of testing to pick up very little signal um, and, and is a burden to the people that have to go through that testing. When the consequences of becoming seriously ill from the virus were much, much more real and much more common. It made sense for some companies and universities to do widespread asymptomatic testing. Frankly, most medical centers did not. Now that everybody's vaccinated, especially at a place like Vanderbilt University, it's really, really tough to make the case to go through the exercise given even lower sensitivity plus everybody's vaccinated. And so the risk of people becoming seriously ill is vanishingly small. Thanks, Jeff. Um, Dr. Jones, could I ask you to follow up on that and talk about it in the specific uh, application and what we've been working on here? Sure. I, I think um, I agree with Dr. Balzer that, you know, it, it, it is an imprecise measure and our rates were very, very low last year, but it was an important tool for us when we didn't have vaccination. Now we're, we're moving towards a more of a sentinel kind of approach where we look at a sample. And what, the reason we wanna do that is to have situational awareness of, of what's going on around us and what trends are starting to develop. So, um, you know, and, and the good news is we can, we can toggle that up or toggle that down depending on what we see and what the need is. Thanks, Pam. Um, a related question um, I'm gonna ask you to address that touches upon both previously submitted questions and also some that we're getting in the chat. Um, does the university, has the university considered and have plans to bring back the COVID-19 dashboard that we had during last academic year? Um, do you want me to answer that one? I, I think there, yes. Uh, yes, we, we, we are working on creating a good way to look at the data. The, the data will be different than last year because last year we had a, a, a you know, massive testing program. So that positivity rate was an extremely important indicator for us that we followed. But the reality is now that positivity rate of our testing program is gonna be higher because there's less people in it and the people who are in it are close contacts unvaccinated or in or being tested for a particular reason. So when we do put that dashboard out, people need to frame it in the right way um, because it is going to look different. Um, given the time we have available, I'm going to move to a question um, that I'd appreciate if the chancellor and provost could address um, as well as Dr. Balzer, and that is how are faculty involved in decision-making around COVID policy? It's a very high-level question, but obviously one of particular interest to our audience today. So Chancellor, could you start our discussion on that, please? Yeah, so we have uh, ongoing discussions with uh, both the executive committee and of the faculty senate, which is like, a, um, you know, one of the channels, of course, we're having, we're getting faculty input uh, there's also ongoing discussions going on at the level of uh, deans, individual schools, departments, and so forth. So that dialogue is is uh, is continuing, and um, you know it's important that we keep it going. And uh, this is, of course, is another example of uh, of of having this dialogue um, uh, ongoing. Um, I, there, I think the you know the my, my sense overall is is that there is there is a lot of concern. There's a lot of concern, um, both within our faculty and other members of our community. Um, as you heard, you know, from Dr. Balls, from Dr. Schaffner, from Dr. Jones, um, you know, we 
this is an evolving situation. We we feel good on where we are, uh, but you know it's a, it's a, there there are some there are some significant challenges here. Um, so I think it's very important that people stay engaged. You know, ask their questions, reach out to us directly through various channels, whether it's through the executive committee, through their deans, through their chairs, um, or or contact us directly so that we can just make sure where the concerns are and then can that can be addressed appropriately. Gonna hand it over to the provost. Sure, I think that, that those channels are really, really important to know about and use. And I think the additional point that I would make is that there's a lot of uh, communication happening minute by minute, hour by hour, um, that maybe faculty may be less aware of. So for example, when deans hear of faculty concern, uh, those communications are transmitted to the Office of Provost, where we then have you know, an immediate moment to turn around, come to a decision as a group, and then communicate that back to deans so that that can communicate to you. In other words, um, it's not as if the question falls into a space that it, um, gets lost. We are very, very aware of and then responsive to um, those kinds of concerns, including at you know, 7 a.m. in the morning, holding uh, you know, spot phone calls that uh, really are to address a, a recent change in, for example, how many uh, chairs should there be in the dining halls. Those kinds of concerns uh, we address and that we then use uh, both the MyVU channel uh, of communication as well as channels through the Dean. So just to highlight that that network is uh, activated uh, and active. Um, and I'll turn it over to uh, Eric Kopstein uh, for uh, any follow-up. Or actually I'll throw, uh, take uh, to, to, I'm sorry, to Dr. Balzer uh, from VUMC. All right. Well, what I I'll, I think what I could offer is the um, <clears throat> the role the UMC has been playing um, to the leadership of the university has been one of support and and expert um, advice, and um, I think the the quality of the dialogue around uh, that support between the university and the medical center has been rich, um, and. Um, in many cases, informs um, advice we give to other entities around the nation and the city. Um, so I think that the quality of our dialogue is benefiting both the medical center and the university and the very best experts like Dr. Schaffner are at, at, at times almost daily involved um, in dialogue with the university about what would be best to do and what is the evidence really support. Uh, and, and so that that will continue as long as this goes on. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, the provost mentioned also Eric Kopstein, who's the vice chancellor for administration, has played such a crucial role um, and in a 24-7, uh, 365 way. Um, I don't know, Eric, if you want to speak, since your scope of work includes all employees, um, how we're engaged in ensuring that we hear the voices of all community members in our protocols and processes. Yeah, I really appreciate that um, question, Tracy, as well as the opportunity to be here today. So there are a range of mechanisms through which we harvest input from across the community. Let me give you one example that's fresh in my mind. I meet on a frequent basis with the president and vice president of our university staff advisory council. Think of this as sort of a counterpart to the faculty senate on the staff side that provides advice and guidance. And we are receiving constant input and feedback and thoughts and suggestions and dialogue uh, through that set of channels. Also, we have an extended network of human resources professionals um, who are really sprinkled throughout the schools and all the departments of the university and connected to our central human resources team so that questions and answers and observations can be quickly distributed, um, updates or changes to things can be made, et cetera. And I'd like to say, for example, a one way that that network was really useful was in achieving that very high vaccination rate that we're so proud of that others have alluded to earlier. That was a concerted effort and it took far more than a simple statement by the chancellor and the provost and others to say this is a mandate. It took a community effort of people across the organization listening to assuaging concerns from staff and really convincing people that this was the right direction to go. 
Um, there are probably many more examples I could think of, Tracy, but I'll, I'll, I'll stop there for now. That's terrific. Thank you all very much. I'm going to- hey, Tracy, can I, can I add one piece to this? Of just course. One, like to what to Eric was just saying. I think this is this is really needs to be highlighted. I mean, this was a monumental effort to get to that level of vaccination and to deal with literally one case at a time. And um, it is, it's not it's not as simple as saying, you know, everybody needs to get vaccinated and then it's going to happen. Uh, we see this in many other places, you know, both universities and outside. Um, so just a tremendous amount of work that was going on, particularly on the staff side, I think, which was in some sense the most challenging for us. Um, but we are in great, we're in a great spot there and really handled this very well. A uh, great point and a nice uh, a way to move to a question really focused on a number of questions that we've received um, that are asking us to look at the question of the safety for um, unvaccinated family members of faculty. And in particular, um, what are the risks that faculty pose to their unvaccinated family members, especially children um, who are under 12, such as I have at home, um, and how are campus health and safety protocols built to help keep them safe? Um, Dr. Schaffner, can I ask you to start us on that, please? Surely. So we all know that at the present time, children under the age of 12 are not yet eligible for vaccination. The studies to uh, look at that, those clinical trials, are underway, but we don't anticipate the results of those until the end of the fall, maybe well into the beginning of winter. So what can we do in the meantime? And obviously the answer is to create a cocoon of protection around those children, right? And we do that by having everyone else in the family who is eligible for vaccination, vaccinated. And as those children go out into the world, we try to do everything we can to make every one of their environments, going to school, for example, as protected as possible. We would like the schools to have all the adults in those schools vaccinated, all the children age 12 and up. And I would imagine in most schools, there's still a lot of work to be done there to get those older children vaccinated. And then of course, the old reliable behavioral interventions, masking. You know, children all the way down to age two, if they go to daycare, they can be taught to wear masks and they do it in a very jolly way and become used to it very quickly. Social distancing, teaching children in smaller groups, good hand hygiene, watching the ventilation of the environment, all of those sorts of things uh, I think will help, along with vigilance regarding symptoms. Should symptoms occur, call or email, text your healthcare provider because testing may well be in order. Uh, Pam? Yeah, I, I, you said it uh, perfectly. And re remember the three layers of protection I talked about. And, and if you have somebody you're worried about in your own home, use all three layers when you're here. You know, stay away from people, wear your masks, and you're vaccinated. And what we're seeing in contact tracing, actually, it's usually the other way around. It's the children who are positive from community act. It's not, it's not the parents taking it home. And we're already starting to see whole households because the child picked it out out in the community. Because remember, we we have one of the highest vaccinated populations on this campus, so it's you're far more likely to come become exposed to it from community activities than here. Right. Thank you very much for that, um, Pam. You also I know have been doing some work looking at trying to monitor and control if we have any evidence that might lead us to believe that there's a potential hot spot or other kind of activity that requires intervention. Can you talk a little bit about how you're doing that? Sure, thank you so much for bringing that up because I meant to mention it earlier. Hotspot testing is a really important tool and we used it last year and we've already used it this year. And I will tell you the hotspot was not from something that happened on our campus. It was a class of students who went to an outside facility and got together. It wasn't a Vanderbilt event, but we very quickly through contact tracing started figuring out, oh, wait a minute, there was this big party. And so we quickly, like within the next day, called that dean and said, we need to test this entire class. And they were tested, turnaround time is 24 hours for our test. We knew who was positive the next day and we quickly got them into isolation. And again, that's how you shut down a hotspot very quickly. And we've got all of the capacity to do that. 
Pam, that's great. Thank you very much for um, providing some explanation for the hard work everyone on the command center team is doing that is not visible to all of us, but I think it's important as faculty that we understand and appreciate that work is going on. I'm sorry, I'm looking a little bit like Max Headroom here with the, the video. Um, so I'm gonna move on. We are getting a number of questions about students, understandably, right? Given what we do, whether in the classroom with students, in the lab with students, um, so I'd like to ask a question that I'm going to direct to GL Black, who is our Vice Provost for Student Affairs and Dean of Students. Um, and I would sort of compile the questions and simply saying, how are we trying to encourage, support, ensure faculty comply, faculty students comply with COVID protocols? And what are we doing when a, fac a student tests positive um, or is contact traced? Thank you, Tracy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. And I, I think we, um, I'll address the second question first because we're actually doing uh, very similar procedures to what we did last year. When a student tests positive um, or we have an identified close contact, we are employing the same strategies um, for on-campus students in terms of uh, transporting them to quarantine and isolation housing and providing resources, support, uh, food, assisting them with all of their needs while they're uh, in quarantine and isolation housing. We are, as Pam noted earlier, exploring some contingencies for additional facilities to use for quarantine and isolation um, housing. Um, so we're very much what we were doing last year in terms of uh, support for students who may test positive and need to isolate or who are in quarantine for close contact. Um, we also, uh, employ uh, very similar strategies that we're employing across the university in terms of communicating with students and encouraging uh, healthy, safe practices in support of the health and well being of our entire community. Um, and that includes uh, working generally with students around planning activities and events um, with their student organizations or in other contexts, um, discouraging uh, off campus activities, and particularly when they're interacting with. Nashville community members who are uh, more likely to be unvaccinated um, and really uh, using some of the same tools we used last year uh, in terms of campaigns around students really uh, stepping up and thinking about the health and safety of our community as a whole when making uh, decisions and for students with accommodations, um, ensuring that they are uh, complying with the requirements that are outlined for them as part of their accommodation. So it's a layered strategy. Um, obviously, also with escalation protocols for uh, issues that we may have through our student accountability um, office. Thanks a lot, GL. That's really helpful. I also want to ask Pam if you could follow up on the specific question of what happens when a student in a class is diagnosed as having COVID-19. Who's contacted? How is that processed? So the, the, the first step of the process is an intake process that the contact tracing team does. And the contact tracing team does a detailed intake interview that identifies exactly where that student has been and who their likely close contacts are. If you remember last year, any time you were defined as a close contact and that was within six feet with or without a mask for 15 minutes cumulatively, um, you know, you had to quarantine, but in a heavily vaccinated population, people who are vaccinated are exempt from quarantine based on the CDC regulations. They are required, or we require them to go test. Uh, it's recommended that they test if they're a close contact. So they will be notified that they are a close contact. Um, in the classroom setting, the only really time that would happen is if you've got a um, uh, and if the unvaccinated individuals and there's not distancing and masking because in a classroom setting, um, you know, we, we'll see. It may, our, our view on this may change, but if, if they've got their masks on and they're in that classroom setting and they're vaccinated, um, we're not gonna notify everybody in the class that there was somebody, we're gonna notify those people who really did have true interactions, lunches, dinners, hung out together, um, you know, roommates, those sorts of things. And those individuals will be notified. They'll be tested as a close contact. And of course, if they're positive, we'll isolate. And anybody who's unvaccinated who will still be quarantined. 
Thank you. Um, as we're running out of time, I want to capitalize on having Dr. Schaffner available to all of us by asking him a compound question. I hope he'll forgive me. Um, so my questions are really around um, two ideas. One is this notion of layers of protection. Last year in the university, we ensured physical distancing in every room. We ensured people were wearing masks everywhere they went. We're not doing exactly the same thing this year. And so it'd be helpful if you could try to talk to us a little bit, if you would please, about the idea that there are layers of protection and, and, and the prioritization of those protections. And then a very narrow question, but relevant to so many of the people on this call, you already mentioned about when we're likely to get vaccines for the current group of under 12s. I think there's just a desire for a little more reassurance about that and details, particularly if you divided those younger kids up into kind of the above six and below six range. So compound, take it in any order you want. So uh, Tracy, uh, first of all, uh, thank you. Uh, Pam has talked about uh, having several protection mechanisms. The uh, image I like to have is uh, every barrier is a little bit like a slice of Swiss cheese, right? It provides a barrier, but it has some gaps. None of them are perfect. So we use a whole series of barriers and most of the gaps are pretty well covered so that by, by doing a number of things, more or less in a sustained way, we reduce the risk for everyone. And that includes everything from masking to good hand hygiene, good ventilation, social distancing, avoiding large group events, particularly indoors if you can. And then of course, uh, vaccination, which is probably the thickest slice of that Swiss cheese with the smallest holes. So if we do all of those things, perhaps not all of them all of the time, but many of them many times, then we will reduce the risk very, very substantially. Uh, the second thing has to do with, uh, we're all waiting for, uh, at least many of us are waiting for the results of these clinical trials. We want the result of these clinical trials to be done very, very well, because if, as we move down the age ladder, obviously the doses for those children have to be determined. And in each age group, we want good information that the vaccines are going to be safe as well as effective. We need to give that some time. We started with older people, worked down the age ladder, and this is still ongoing. So hang tight. The best guesstimates and their guesstimates are that these trials will mature with the different companies, first for the older children and then down, on down to the younger children, the end of this fall and well into this winter, I think. In the meantime, all the rest of us should get vaccinated to provide what I call that cocoon of protection around those young children. Um, and I love that imagery and that's extremely helpful. So many thanks. Um, so my special thanks to all the panelists. I think that we are incredibly lucky as faculty at Vanderbilt to have these wonderful, talented people uh, leading us and supporting us through this crisis. Um, I also wanna thank everyone who attended the event today and particularly those of you who submitted questions. While we were not able to get to the many questions, excellent questions that you submitted, we will engage with them on the health and safety of FAQ, uh, FAQ that we post in the COVID page. Please be patient as we work through those um, in order to post them. And if you uh, feel frustrated and haven't gotten an answer, please feel free to reach out to me so I can ensure that we get your question addressed. Um, finally, I also wanna take a moment to thank people who are not always visible to us as faculty, but we're absolutely dependent on. And that includes our people in communications who organized this event, worked overnight to make sure we had everything ready to support you. And um, I just wanna give it a special shout out to Melanie Moran, Kate Derrick, and Catherine Keith, who've really been um, so important to our effort. So um, please join me in thanking, although we can't see you, our wonderful panelists. And, um, and I look forward to speaking with you and working with you throughout the semester. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.